Hello, welcome to our event about late Hokusai drawings. A uh, particularly warm welcome to our colleagues at the British Academy who are co-hosting the event. At the British Museum until the 30th of January next year, we are presenting the special exhibition Hokusai, the great picture book of everything. It's the thesis of this exhibition and the accompanying book that the recently discovered hundred or so small drawings are a major late work by Hokusai. They teach us much about his working methods and intellectual interests in his later years. The museum is grateful to the Theresia Gerda Buch bequest and Art Fund for their support towards the acquisition of the drawings, to the Asahi Shimbun for their sponsorship of the exhibition, and to the Japan Society for their support of the public program. The more I look at these tiny masterpieces, the more I'm struck by their energy, their eccentricity, their skill, and even their emotional punch, all qualities which I savour in Hokusai's art in his final years. I've come to understand that we should not accept the short text that accompanies the drawings as autograph from Hokusai's hand. Under scientific examination, it turns out to be written on different paper from the drawings themselves, which means that the date of 1829 given in that text is probably not correct. However, I'm convinced that the title of the project, Great Picture Book of Everything, and the attribution to Hokusai are correct. Today, we've invited four colleagues who have studied Hokusai to join me to debate the 103 drawings and the ramifications of their rediscovery. First, we'll hear from Asano Shugo, leading Hokusai scholar in Japan. Then I'll be joined by three curators from the USA who care for major Hokusai collections there. From north to south, Sarah Thompson at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, John Carpenter at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and Frank Feltons at the Freer Sackler Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, DC. You'll find brief biographies of my four guests uh, on the homepage for this event. I'd like to thank all four scholars most warmly for their participation today and also for assisting my online research into the 103 drawings during lockdown. We're not going to sort out all of the problems of attribution of late Hoxai drawings in 90 minutes, but we can certainly make a start. I'm now going to present four slides to introduce some key issues. This is surely the most dynamic and literally explosive composition in the group, as a bolt of lightning strikes Virudhaka dead, an episode from the early history of Buddhism in ancient India. The slide illustrates the very different character of a preparatory drawing on the left compared to the final stage block ready drawing on the right, a neat line perfect drawing which is normally destroyed during the cutting of the cherry wood printing blocks. Hoxai had been preparing block ready drawings like these for prints and book illustrations since he was a teenager, but 99% do not survive. It's the 1% of surviving block ready drawings that we are here to talk about today. A key resource for studying Hoxai's working methods in his later career is the so-called Curtis album at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It collects together what are described as his rough sketches, soko, for a variety of book illustrations and sheet prints from Hoxai's 70s and 80s. The album contains about 150 drawings, many of them just fragments. On the right, notice the particular virtuosity of the way in which the flash of the explosion radiates out from the center of the block ready drawing, cutting through the limbs and drapery of the figure. Think of the mental grip needed to draw this without making any mistakes. And then salute the skill of the long suffering block cutter who will have to reproduce this in cherry wood. Don't forget, 
Both of these drawings are only the size of a picture postcard. Another major discovery of our research has been the close connections between the 103 drawings at BM and the 178 at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. All of the drawings in Boston are Hokusai's versions of subjects in traditional picture encyclopedias. All of the natural world subjects among the 103 at BM also come from the picture encyclopedias. My thesis is that the India and China drawings at BM must represent the ambition of Hokusai and his publisher to expand the scope of these popular illustrated encyclopedias. I've chosen here details from a BM drawing and a Boston drawing that I find particularly close. The overall subject of an animal coloured with ink wash being sprayed by energetic tentacles of foaming water is the same in each case. In the red boxes highlighted on each drawing, you can see that particular micro mannerisms of style are even the same. It is inconceivable to me that different artists drew these two drawings, and I'm convinced that artist was Hokusai, possibly assisted by his artist daughter, Eijo. We tend to use her name, her art name, Oi, by convention. Oi was living and working with her father for the last 20 years of his life. How her activities contributed to the phenomenon of late Hokusai will be an important theme today. With their three major subject categories of India, China and the natural world, we can now work to reconnect the 103 drawings for the great picture book of everything with the rest of Hokusai's oeuvre. A particularly rich example is shown here. Long famous has been the BM's hanging scroll painting on silk, ducks in flowing water, done when Hokusai was 88 in 1847, here shown on the left. Already known, too, is the related printed illustration and instructions on how to paint a mallard duck in picture book Essence of Colouring, Ehon Tsu, that came out in 1848, just the year before Hokusai died here shown on the right. In the conversation that follows with Asano Shugo, he proposes the fascinating theory that the BM's 103 drawings should be dated to the mid 1840s, when Hokusai was in his mid 80s. This would chime with the contents and estimated date of two short notes written by Hokusai to the publisher Suzanne Bohr, acknowledging payment for a number of pages of drawings for the great picture book of everything. If we try out a date of mid 1840s for the BM drawing of the water birds, that's the center right, then a particularly rich cluster of images can be assembled, which link not only thematically, but also in terms of date. It's undeniable that research into Hokusai's drawings has lagged behind that of his prints, books, and paintings. The issues of connoisseurship are challenging and the work of his pupils is still relatively understudied. One question I'll explore with our panel today is how can we progress research into Hokusai school drawings? A powerful tool we are beginning to use at the British Museum is a new online research platform called ResearchSpace. This exploits the capacity of the web to link disparate data and define relations between that data. For my study of the 103 drawings, so far, I have used the system mainly for two purposes. The first is to annotate the inscriptions and motifs in each of the drawings. The second is to link each drawing with other works by Hokusai with which they share a common theme, style or technique. This final slide shows a so-called knowledge map, which connects together various images of water birds that Hokusai did in his later career. You're seeing a static screen grab, but in fact, the system is live and each image of a work connects back to rich resources of data that can be constantly updated. That's probably enough from me by way of preliminary remarks. I'm sure you are keen to hear from our four guests. Because of the challenge of working in two languages and the time differences among three continents, we have divided the event into two parts. First, I will have a conversation with Dr. Sano in Japanese with subtitles.
for about 30 minutes. Then in the second part, lasting about an hour, we'll switch to English for some short slide presentations and a four-way conversation among the curators. By way of preparation, I asked the curators to describe briefly the important block-ready drawings by Hoxai in the collections of their respective museums, and then to share their perspectives on how the new discoveries about the 103 drawings at the BM and the 178 drawings at the, in Boston changed the story of late Hoxai. So now for the conversation with Dr. Asano. Hello. Today, uh, we are here to have a conversation with Dr. Asano Shugo, who is director of the museum Yamato Bunkakan in Nara in uh, Western Japan. Um, my name is Tim Clark. I'm a curator, former curator at the British Museum. And I'm particularly happy to speak with Asano-san today about Hokusai drawings, uh, partly because he's one of my oldest friends in Japan and it's great to see uh, his face, but also because he is one of the world experts on the artist Hokusai. Uh, we worked together on a big exhibition which was shown at the British Museum in 2017 and then at Mr. Asano's museum where he's director uh, in uh, Osaka. So uh, we've known each other a long time. Uh, I respect his judgment enormously. And during the lockdown, he was very, very helpful in our study of the 103 drawings which were recently acquired by the British Museum. So Asano-san, thank you very much indeed for speaking with us today. Uh, and I'm going to give the questions in Japanese. He'll reply in Japanese uh, and we'll take it from there. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Sate, ano, saisho no shitsumon nan desu kere domo, eh, hokusai no nikuhitsu byosen ga, tsumari drawing nitsuite, motto mo suburashi to mo koto wa nan desu ka? Panga ni natta sakuhin mo fukumete eh, okangai kudasai. Sore kara, hokusai no hanshitae no tokushitsu wa なんだと考えますかえ、うん。北斎のドローイングで私がやっぱり最も素晴らしいと思うのはあの線ですね。あのラインと言いますか。あの つまり素晴らしい修行をしてきたと絵画の比重が大きくなっているわけですね。ですから、え、の線と面が、あの、墨の線と面が、やはりあの、ま、
やはりあの綺麗な線を綺麗な反射で描く修練も修練をまあメインにそれを信じているということがあります。北斎はそのどちらでもないあるいはどちらも北斎は取り入れているという。ですからあの何を言いたいかというと墨一色のものを描いても線は線として成立するように頑張るんですよね。つまり非常に魅力的な線がですね。あの面の部分、墨の広がりがなくても、線だけで、えー、自分の表現を完結させようという意識が非常に強いと私は思っています。もちろん、あの墨絵、水墨のようなものも描きますけれども、それはあの線と面があって、それをこう融合させているという感覚だと思うんですね。ですから、あの結論から言うと、私はあの北斎のドローイング、北斎のドローイング、で一番素晴らしいのは非常にあの優れた自在なあのつまり、えー、他の人に真似できないあのやっぱりタッチ線,線だと思ってます。ありがとうございました。うんえー、さて2番目の質問なんですが日本では北斎のドローイングはどのように研究されてますかいわゆる日清序まずとして知られる一軍の作品のドローリングについてお話しいただけますか近年九州国立博物館へ寄贈されましたね、えー、北斎のドローイングの研究は日本ではあのまあ非常にって言いますか歯が歯がや肉質画の研究に比べれば相対的に遅れているあの遅れていいると思いますその理由はあのいくつか考えてるんですけれども一つはあの日清呪文はあの例外なんですけれどもあの、えー、反死体や死体も含めていわゆる北斎のドローイングの作品がの 80% ぐらいがあの欧米にあるということなんですね。あそうですねドローインはどうしてもあの目の前にあのこう直に見ないとその魅力やあの面白さが分からない伝わらない、えー、伝わらないことが多いと思うんですねそれがあの身近にないっていうことはあの大変あの、うん、それを研究するのに難しいとあのですからそれからあの浮世絵日本では浮世絵というのは長い間あの版画を中心に研究されてきたということがあります。ですから、あのそのプラス、プラス、そのいわゆる肉質が絵画というものをもう研究されてはいた,いたんですけれども、いわゆるドローイングというものは、そのその後にと言いますか、版画やの普通の、まあ、彩色された肉質がよりも、より重要だとは考えられていなかった。つまり、えー、肉質がよりはあのもう少しあの二次的なものだろう。で、版画ではないということがあって、研究が遅れてた。だから、あのまあ、そういう、主にその2つの理由で、えー、遅れ、研究が遅れてたというよりもあの、ドローイングの魅力に気づく人が少なかったと。いいいいうふうに言っていいと思いますですから研究も遅れてて、えー。で、日清女まずなんですけども、これはあの珍しく日本にあの、えー、ほとんどの作品、90% 以上は日本にありますけども、えー、2年、2、3年前に九州国立博物館に寄贈された一番大きなセット、200点以上のセットはですね、あの今でもそうですけど、あの研究者が気軽にそれを見るというようなことがずっとできないで、今まで来ました。ようやく、いわゆる九州高齢作物館に行くと、まあ、我々研究者はあの場合によっては見ることができるという状態にようやくなったということがありますので、まあ、これから、これからに期待したいですね。えー、で、妊娠上まずはあの、まあえー、まあ、簡単に言うと、その、国際の80年代に、最晩年に
約あの1年半ぐらいにわたって、毎日朝、あの七紙のに関係する絵を描いて、そしてそれからあのその日の画業をスタートさせたというようなあことがあって、ですから、まあ、約500、600ぐらい、多分北斎は毎朝七紙を描いたんだと思うんですね。現在はそのうちの、うん、お,おそらく250点ぐらいは残ってる結構たくさん残ってると思うんですがこれはあのまねにあの面もありますあの次にあのお見せするスライドはあの珍しくですね,いいですね珍しくあのなんか雲のようなあのいわゆるあの墨、えー、の薄墨がこう背景にえー、描かれてますけども、これは非常に珍しい、あの西ジョマとしては非常に珍しいタイプですね。90% 以上はあの線だけで、それもデザイナーの魅力的な、あのいろんなあのタイプのものを交えて線だけで描かれた、非常にあの北斎らしいといいますか、北斎のドローイングの一つの、えー、行き着いた究極の形ではないかなと、私は思っていますありがとうございました。えー、さて3番の質問、クエスチョンナンバー3浅野先生のお考えでは、大英博物館の万物絵本大全図103点は、北斎のその他の作品とどのように関連し合いますかまた、晩年期の北斎についてどのような新しいことを教えてくれますかうん大学時間の万物絵本大全図はそのもうすでにあのクラークさんが、えー、お書きになっているように北斎のまあ北斎漫画やそ,のそれ以外の北斎が出版したあの半本鋭利半本の家内のものとこういわゆるあの、まあ、あ構造骨格画題とかが非常に類似するというものでもありますしそれから非常に重要なのはあのもちろんボストン美術館が、えー、所有している、まあ、タイトルのないあの3冊の半紙体というのも,のと,、まあ、もと,まあと密接というよりもおそらくというかほぼ確実に両方とも万物日本大全のにほとんどが万物絵本大全と言っていいだろうというふうに思われるものですし、えー、で、クラクさんもちろん書いていらっしゃる、あの、パリ・ビブリティック・ナショナレで持っている、北斎の総講集と、まあ、あのタイトルにある作品は、のいくつかは、あの、万物絵本大全の、大、ていうんですか、えー、下書きですよね。まあまあ、ほぼ、うん、肉質がどのように密接に関連するかというのはこれからの課題ですけれども、えー、北斎が40代以降、50代以降に制作した主に半本類とのほとんどと関連する非常に重要な作品だともちろん思っております。で、おそらくこの大学物館の万物絵本大全は、私はあのボストンのものと、ボストンのものも万物日本大全の一部だと申し上げましたけれども、少しこう制作時期にこうずれがある、時差があると思っていて、はい、ボストンのものは、まあ、あの70代後半からぐらいかなという感覚があるんですが、大のものはやっぱり80代半ば、まあ、80代だというふうに思ってるんで、思ってまして。まあ、数年あるいはもっと,もっとその感覚が空くかもしれないとまあ思ってますがあの両方ともあの非常に魅力的なものでありますし特にあの大英のものはあの最晩年の北斎の代表的なドローイングという意味ではあの日清序末に匹敵するまあ僕は日清序末とほぼ同じ時期かなというふうにあそうですかうん、まあそんなに違わない80代半ばっていう点で言えば、まあ、日清ジョマよりも少し後かもしれないし
、まあ、厳密にキャッチだけで判定はできないんですが、まだ、多少あの、ただ確実にその、非常にあのこう、澄んだきれいな線をですね、書くことがなかなか難しくなった時代の北斎だろうと思ってます。ですから、まあ、80代のことはほぼ確実かな、個人的には思ってますけど、まあ、もちろんその、えー、後でお話しすることになると思うんですが、あの手紙の受け取り、両学校の料金の受け取り上の制作時期とも関連しますけれども、晩年だと思ってます。うん、じゃあ、4番目の質問。This is the fourth question。浅野先生は103点に含まれる文字だけの一応について。国際の手になるものではない可能性を指摘くださいました。このことは残りの102点についてどのような意味を持ってきますかえっと、その文字だけのものを外せば全く問題がないと思ってます。うん、文字だけのもの、それからもちろんあの、箱とかのつまりケースですけどね、それは後でつけられたものであって、で中身はあの奥さんへの手になる万物基本大戦だと、まあ、それがまあ私の,あの考えです。細かく言うとあの、いいですかね。どうぞどうぞ。<笑>まあ,あの、別に全部やる。その、文字だけのものがどうして、えー疑問なのかということについてはいくつか結構ありましてまずこれが何のために作られたのかその役割がよくわからないというのが一番大きな理由ですねそれからその2つ印象がありますそれその印象はあのえー、吉野山という印象は60前後で使われたもので晩年のものではないというしこの,この印象、陰影が全く合う吉野山の陰というものがまだ見つかってないということが、はい、すごく大きいですね。うん、藤山方の陰もあの 100% 一致するものがなかなかないしこの陰は70代半ばだからそれ以降に作られ,作られた今までの,あ、まあ、あの研究によるとですねつまりこの2つの因が同時に押されているということはあの矛盾するそれに陰影が合わないというのはやはり重要ですし、うん、国際は因を2つ以上使うことがないと私は<笑>あの理解しているてい、うん、私の知っていく人が全て一因なのでそれもおかしいまあそういう意味ではあのうん、まあ、それが非常に大きな理由ですけども、細かいことを言うと、えー、手紙が2つ2通残ってますね。80代の手紙は、あのいわゆる最晩年っていうか、80代、あるいは70代から80代にかけての国際の遺憾の死体であると。で、そのタイトルは、バムデヒョン大全。図っていうのは、まあ、個人的には取りたいんですけど、万物日本大全で、はい、ほぼ確実かなと、個人的には思っています。そういう点では、あの、あの文字だけの部分は、あの、半分正しいんですけど、正しいんですけど。<笑><笑>次のスライドは、えー、大英博物館が所蔵している、えー、百人一首、乳母が絵解きの、半下絵の一枚ですよね。あの、半下絵はあの、そうです。半下絵はあの、次の半下絵とこの二つスライドを示したのは、少し理由があって、その、さっきの初めの、初めの方のスライドがあの、の方がよりあの、北斎、半下絵なので、これはあの、えー、西島と違って、半死体なので、それをちゃんと理解しなきゃいけないと。半死体はあの確実に版画を作るために、うん、彫り師に渡すものですから
、緩和を作るということを前提に線を作っているということなんです。ですから、あの堀市があのいわゆる掘りにくい線はやっぱり困るんですよね。そういう点で言えば、あのこのこの作品、えー、っと、つまり、平の、平の金森ですね。平の金森よりも、その次の、急南音金助ですかね。その次の,あの船のある作品の方が、私は、あの、掘りやすいと思ってるんです。いわゆる、あの、線にあまり不必要なブレとか揺れとか、途切れとかが少ない。えー、結論から言うと、この,この中南の金助の方は、かなりの部分があの、娘の王位の手助けが入っているといいますか、最終的に王位が推奨してる可能性が、全部じゃないですよ、かなりの部分を推奨してる可能性があるんじゃないかと、個人的には思ってて、で前の方の金助は、北斎自身の部分が多いっていいますか、そういう感覚があるんですね。ほんと微妙ですけども、うんはい、あの北斎と多い一緒に住んでますのでずっと最後の、ねうん、20年間であまりにもあの多いの楽観が入る作品が少ないのに何をしてた<笑>そういう質問が当然出てきますよね。そうですね、であの北斎の確かあの北斎の、えー、手紙の一つの中に、えー、老いが書く予定だった百人一首の中本親父あの老人つまり北斎自身が、えー、書くことにしたという旨のことが書いてありますよね。そうするとまあかなり柔軟に、えー、2人が協力して、えー、注文された作品を仕上げるイメージが見えてくるんじゃないかと思いますけどいかがですかああの私は私ももちろんそう思っていますそして肉質画のいくつかについてはあの奥さんが大体の構図を決めるにしても最終的には脳衣が仕上げたものっていうのもあるかなまあどれをそれにするかあの確定するのは難しいにしてもあるんだろうと思ってますし、うん、それはいろんな研究者がそれぞれ発言しているのでまあ全面的に動揺はできないにしてもあの大いの手が入っている作品っていうのはこれからいろいろピックアップできるんだろうと思ってます。そそそのの次スライドはあのこ,うそそこから3点はあの全てあの大博物館の監視隊がいろんなものと関連するということを見せたかっただけで特にそれ以上のことはないんです。あの一つの,あの主題造形を奥さんはいろんな形で表現するように、えーまあ、方言表現してるんじゃないかというふうにまあ思ってます。まあ、あとはあのその文字の部分ですね。この大発大英本のあの文字はやはりオストミスカのものに比べて少しこう大きくてなんか多少あ荒々しいっていうはいと思いませんか？<笑>思いませんいや。思います。はい。場合場合には。あのまあ、それはやはり時期の、えー、制作時期の違いっていうのは、やはりそ,その辺に表れていると思ってますし、まあ、私はまあ、基本的に多少問題はあるにせよ、大学物館の、うん、文字のほとんどは北斎自身のもの。全部と言い切れる自信はないんですが、北斎自身のもの、ほとんど北斎自身のものだと思ってますが、あのえー、先ほどの話、あのスーザンボーの、あスーザンボーじゃない、版元の受け取り中、受け取りの
、えー、受け取り証の、つまり文書があの2通残ってるのは、あの、クラークさんも一応書いてますけども、その2通の日付が、あの、1日しか1日だけ違いますね。はい。ね。ということは、あの2通は少なくとも、あの、1年、2年、3年ぐらい、つまり、間があるっていうか、次の日であるわけがないと思いますので、その住んでいる場所も違いますね。はい、そうですね。新井町と小梅村。そうです、そうです。それに一つはあの印象があるのに、もう一つはどうもない、どうもないらしいというのも分かります。あの印象は、あのどうもあの葛飾院のいわゆる第三タイプなんじゃないですか。ええ、80代に使う印象そう。80歳以降に使われている第三期の院。で間違いないと思うんです。それもだいぶ摩耗しているので、やっぱり八十代、八、う、十、ん、代半ばぐらい、普通に考えればそういうふうに思われます。ですから、かなり何年間かにわたって、北斎は少しずつこの万物四大禅の暗示体を書いていたということはわかるかなと思うんです。で、結局、未完に終わってしまいますけれども、うん、もっと想像をたくましくすると、ボストンのものはもっと前に書いていて、えーうん、まあ結局その2つは、近代に入ってから別の伝わり方をして、現在はボストンと大変になっちゃうんですけども、うん、やはり、えー、まあ、まあ、効果不効果、まあ、幸いなのかもしれませんが、その出版されずに同意のままで残って、われわれはそれを鑑賞できることが、鑑賞することができることを<笑>、鑑賞する楽しさをね、味わえるということは、僕個人的には素晴らしいことです。<笑>まあ、ようやくあのより、えー、公開できたわけですね。ほとんど200年ぶりに。そうですね。はい。そのインド、中国についてどうお考えですかえー、っと、確かにボストンのものはほとんど日本の主題なので、はい、やはりあの、でもまあ、あの、17世紀の,その万物、絵本大全長方記も結構あの、いわゆる異国のっていいますか、あの国外の,あの,想,像の想像的な頭像も非常に含めてですね、えー、日本以外の中国や天竺やそれ以外の異国のあの図っていうのはそ、それなりに含まれてるんですよね。で、18世紀、19世紀になると、当然あの、貿易もだんだん進行し,て進行しているのもあって、いろんな意味であの異国の情報もいろいろ伝わってきて今、クラクさんがおっしゃったように完成、それから19世紀に入るとやはり頭像の頭の百科事典を作るためにはやっぱり日本編だけではなくてあの中国やあのいわゆる最、まあ、データの。うん他のアジアも含めた国外国のですね、それもそういうものも含めた大きな土入り百科事典を、まあ、小林集団網から要望されたで北、北斎自身がそういうものに非常に興味があった、でその辺の,あのこう、うん、好みといいますかあの、要望、思考が一致したんだと私は思っているんですね。ですから大英のものは、あの、まあ、いわゆるそういうものを中心になったと、まあ、思います。もちろん、あの、えー、クラークさんが、あの、本にまとめているように、一つ一つ、<笑>一点一点、こう、バラバラにして、元の状態を復元しなきゃいけないんですが、で、当然、あの、失われている、今はないものも、自分あると思うので、そういうのも含めると結構大きないわゆる企画って言いますかあの
程度の大きなあの百貨事典をスーザンボーと奥さんを考えてたと。いうことにはもちろん同意し、同意するっていうんです私もそう思ってます。このスライドですよね。このスライドは、あの、まあ、例えばこの、チョーク人という、その、右上は万物四大前長方器なんですけど、チョーク人という図像が、奥さんへのあの、大変のものにもチョーク人っていうのが、まあ、あるということに象徴されるように、北斎は確実に万物絵本大前長方形を見ていて、えー、タイトルもそこから彼は取ったんではないかなというふうに、まあ、全体の構造も含めて、それをあの200年、200年経つかな、170年ぐらい後に今出すとすれば、まあ、俺はあのこんなあの百科事典、金文字を作るんだ。あの作るんだというのがいうようなイメージが北斎にあったんではないかなというふうに思ってまあちょっとそれをあれしたんですけどあのあとまあこれはどう,でど,ど,うでもどうでもいいっていうんですけどあのでもねあの何人かの人はね異彩の作品だという人がい,いるんですね。はいまあえー、伝統的にそういう意見があったらしいんですがそれについては私は異彩であるっていうことはありえないと思ってます、まあ、詳しく説明する時間はありませんがあの比較していろんなことを比較すれば分かることでそれはあのもちろんあのクラークさんもそう思っていると思いますし、うん、同意見です、はい、間違いだということですね以上です。Many thanks to Dr. Asano in Japan for that incredibly stimulating discussion, which has given us a lot to think about and to discuss. We're now going to go west、uh, and head off to Boston, where we have waiting for us、uh, Sarah Thompson, a curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston,、uh, who's made a special study of Hokusai and particularly a related group of Hokusai drawings in the Boston Museum. Thanks so much, Sarah, for your participation today. Over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Tim, for that introduction. Uh, uh, here is the Boston、uh, group of drawings. I was very, very excited to hear about the,、uh, the recent acquisition by the British Museum because it's clear that those drawings are very closely related,、uh, in fact, almost certainly from the very same set、uh, as the ones that we、uh, had already. Uh, been studying in our collection.、Uh, in our case,、um, the drawings, although they're exactly the same size and format as the British Museum drawings,、um, they have been pasted into、um, a kind of mock up of what the book would have looked like if it had ever actually been published.、Um, so they're considered to be albums, they're bound into albums.、Um, and for this reason, ironically, we don't know for certain where they came from. Uh, they were almost certainly part of the massive gift of William Sturgis Bigelow,、uh, who amassed a huge collection in Japan in the 1880s、um, and then donated it to the Museum of Fine Arts in 1911.、Um, but、um, at that time, anything that was in the physical form of a book was considered library material rather than art.、Uh, and so it was not cataloged then,、um, and it was only in the 1990s. Um, initially, with the help of Roger Keyes and various other people, that we began to catalog our、um, Japanese books as art. It's primarily the printed books, but since these drawings were in book form,、uh, they seem to have been counted in that same way. So we probably acquired them in 1911, probably from Bigelow, but we're not certain.、Um, there are many other things we're not certain about.、Um, Even if we look at these together with the British Museum drawings,、uh, we still need to figure out、uh, how large the project was originally supposed to be,、uh, how many volumes were planned,、um, whether we have the,、uh, the pictures in anything like the correct order. So there's still a great deal that we can study.、Uh, I'm showing you here the title pages、uh, that are included in parts of the Boston album in the upper right corner of the slide. Is the title page of what we've been treating as volume one.、Uh, but as a result of Tim's studies and comparisons, 
to the pictorial encyclopedias, it looks as if that's probably volume three. Um, also below that, um, you'll see uh, the title page um, and then the next page after that uh, in a double page spread uh, for what we've been considering as volume two, but almost certainly that is volume one. And actually, even before Tim's study, I was thinking that this logically ought to be volume one because it is the heavens. Um, you see the sun and the moon, and then we go on to various constellations uh, and so on. Uh, so um, I uh, agree with the suggested reordering. Um, volume three uh, of our set does not have any title page. And I wonder whether that was really supposed to be a separate volume or whether possibly those drawings were going to be included with some of the others. Um, in the British Museum set, there is the title page for China and India, uh, which I think was indeed most likely a separate volume. So then were there three volumes? It's an awful lot of drawings. They would have been big, fat volumes. Um, were there more? Um, there are lots of questions here that we don't know. Do we now have all the drawings in the set? Could there possibly be more out there somewhere? That's very intriguing. So um, definitely the composition uh, is one of the big questions to study. Now, another uh, question um, that, uh, that uh, Tim and Asano-san have touched on uh, is the dating. Um, I lean somewhat toward the earlier date. Um, and in fact, um, when this uh, work was first identified as being definitely by Hokusai was back in 2013, um, when uh, the late Nagata Seiji organized an exhibition of our Hokusai works that toured in Japan. And then in 2015, we brought it back to Boston uh, with a grand Hokusai uh, exhibition here at that time. So um, um, Nagata-san thought that uh, this was indeed Hokusai. It had, already, it had already been identified as probably by Hokusai uh, when it traveled to Italy for the big Hokusai exhibition in 1999. So it was identified at that time um, and uh, with a note that further study is required. Um, and as a result of his further studies, he concluded that yes, it is by Hokusai. He had an interesting suggestion for the possible date and possible identity. But this, of course, is before we um, knew anything about the great picture book of everything. But there is a reference in a, uh, an advertisement for a book, of, a book by Hokusai published in 1823 um, that mentions an otherwise unknown work, um, the, uh, the Chicken Rib Picture Book, um, which we, we loosely translated as, as Hokusai's Tasty Morsels. Um, chicken rib is a Chinese literary expression for something that is um, small but good, uh, like the meat on a chicken rib. Um, so uh, Nagata-san's suggestion was that uh, possibly these drawings were for that otherwise unknown uh, book, uh, which suggests uh, the 1820s. Um, of course, now um, we also know about the uh, letter uh, and the various connections of the 1840s. Um, and just to throw in that decade in between the 1830s, uh, there's very suggestive evidence uh, in the fact that uh, some of the Boston drawings are very close to uh, actual color prints that were produced uh, in the early 1830s. Um, there's one example uh, from the 36 views of Mount Fuji, um, that boat uh, that's in the Boston album. Another thing I would suggest is um, note how similar the format is. Uh, to this is one of the reasons I lean toward the earlier date, that horizontal format uh, is very, very similar uh, to the 1823 book. Um, and I'm not sure how long um, that, uh, that horizontal format was in fashion. Um, I tend to think of it as being earlier, but it, it of course could have been uh, used later on as well. So uh, many interesting questions about the date still to be looked into. Now, these are examples of just a few other uh, Hokusai drawings uh, in our collection. Um, and these are things that uh, ironically, because they were loose and not pasted into albums, were cataloged as art from the time that we first acquired them. Um, the uh, very famous print series, um, the 100 poems explained by the nurse uh, was never uh, actually finished. 
uh, of the 100 uh, designs, only 27 of them uh, were uh, produced as finished prints, but he does seem to have done all the drawings. Um, most of them have survived, and we have three of them. Uh, so I show you one example there. Uh, so again, that's a block ready drawing uh, that was supposed to have been made into a print. We also have little informal sketches that he made for his pupils. Um, you see two examples uh, there on the left um, with explanations for them of how you do certain things, uh, such as balance a dancing figure, or um, I, I love the explanation for how you, uh, you put a uh, white uh, paint spray uh, onto a picture of a ship and there, there he draws himself blowing on the brush and going anyway. So those are just other examples. Uh, we do have one other set, uh, which is extremely interesting um, and uh, somewhat similar uh, to the uh, drawings um, in Boston and in the British Museum that we've been talking about. Um, this is uh, two uh, albums, one of three volumes and one of six volumes, both in Boston. Um, and uh, in one case, we have the preliminary drawings. In the other case, uh, we, those are on the left. On the right, we have the block ready drawings, again, for a book that was never actually published. Um, and uh, we had actually had both of these for a while. Um, and I'm happy to say it was the, uh, the Hokusai Research Project at the British Museum that um, noticed and uh, brought to my attention the fact that these are actually uh, the same uh, drawings or it's the preliminary and the finished versions of the same subjects. It's very interesting that we have both of them. Uh, once again, we don't know for sure where these came from, probably Bigelow. Um, usually our, um, our uh, museum acquisition numbers indicate the date when we got it. In this case, it's the date when we cataloged it. It had been there for um, probably well over a century already. Um, so the interesting thing about these is that the preliminary drawings uh, actually um, are in two stages. Um, we have uh, the, as you see in the lower uh, drawing on the left, um, most of them are very quick sketches in very pale ink, uh, something that an artist like Hokusai could have done in minutes um, very quickly and easily. But then um, uh, in the uh, group of 32 drawings, just six of them, have details added in dark ink, uh, as you see above. So there is a light ink drawing under that, and then it's got the uh, much greater detail uh, in darker ink. Um, so it looks like a logical progression. Start with the sketch, then fill in with uh, the details with darker ink, and then on to the block-ready drawing. But actually, we do have block-ready drawings um, for all of those pictures, even the ones uh, for which we only have the light uh, ink. Um, there's also question as to whether the block ready drawings were by Hokusai himself or by uh, one of the pupils. And of course, his daughter Oi is a, is a prime suspect for that kind of thing. Uh, could this be her? Um, I think Asano-san leans toward uh, thinking that this is Hokusai, uh, but there are other possibilities to keep in mind. Um, so again, that relationship between Hokusai and the pupils uh, and how we, uh, we determine uh, the hand in the drawings is yet another interesting thing to investigate. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Uh, that's wonderful. You've opened up so many of the questions that I, would, I was hoping we would get to, to talk about. Um, and I just dream of the time when we'll be able to put the BM 103 and the Boston 178 in the same room together and really examine them with the naked eye and get them under the microscope. Um, just one quick question for you, Sarah. I hope I'm not preempting anything, but uh, in our recent online conversations, you've talked to me about a, an idea to do an exhibition of Hoxai school works from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. That is uh, actually coming up. It's been confirmed. Um, it will be in the spring of 2023. So I am, I am working on that now. Um, it's a bit frustrating because, as you noted, we just know so little about the pupils. Um, so ideally, I would have liked to present something, do something like present the results of a great research project, but I'm going to have to go at it from the other end and instead present these interesting things that we don't know a lot about yet and hope that that will spark a further interest and further work on them.
Uh, but yes, we will be exhibiting. Um, I, I think, uh, well, all, all of the things I've just shown will be included in that show, along with, uh, for example, we have many paintings by the students, uh, quite nice paintings. Um, the one by Oi is rather famous, but uh, we have many others uh, that are not so well known. Um, and we'll be, we'll be showing a selection of those. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to extend it to people who were influenced by Hokusai either during his lifetime or afterward, even up to the present. Um, so bringing, bringing in some colleagues in, uh, in European art and, uh, and even contemporary art. That sounds fantastic, Sarah. And uh, if you need any help, I'm sure we'd all be very glad yes, to please. do it. <laughs> um, and there's a historical resonance here, isn't there? Because uh, wasn't Hoxai and his school the first exhibition done by Ernest Fenelosa yes. at the Boston Museum uh, in the 1890s? Yes, 1892 to 93. And that was actually the first scholarly museum exhibition with a catalog at any American museum of Japanese art. Yeah. So it'll be really fantastic to judge how far we've come. I hope we've come a long way in uh, the intervening century and uh, a quarter or so. Yeah. Yes. Right. Next, shall we move on to uh, curator from New York, from the Metropolitan Museum? Dr. John Carpenter. Uh, I'm going to give away that he's actually sitting in Tokyo speaking to us. So it's very late at night and I apologize for that, John. Uh, we'd hope to talk with you a little, a little more social hours, um, but it's great that you're able to be part of this group. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, presenting to us a few ideas about Hoxai drawings in the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, and the bigger question of how to study drawings of the Hoxai School. Over to you, John. Thanks so much, Tim. I'm delighted to be able to join everyone uh, for this online colloquium, focusing on drawings by Hoxai and his uh, pupils. The British Museum's recent acquisition of the drawings related to the rate picture book of everything provides a wonderful impetus for specialists to re-engage with this area. The, the Met has a handful of albums containing uh, preparatory drawings that are shtai, of various levels of finish and professionalism, some of which are certainly brushed by the master himself, but the majority are most probably by pupils or followers. The Met also uh, has an album of block ready drawings that Hanshta A, uh, comparable to the works that have just been uh, discussed from the British Museum by Tim and Asano san, and also from the MFA by Sarah. Uh, in order to prepare for this online colloquium, and partly out of long standing curiosity, I did try to review all of our drawings by and attributed to Hoxai in our storerooms. And I, I asked and tested myself about how many of these could actually be, be uh, plausibly attributed to the master himself. Admittedly, I realized that this is a bit of a, a subjective enterprise. But in a good number of cases, I did feel I could say, well, that's absolutely by Hoxai. And then in other cases, I thought that we could say that's based on an idea of Hoxai, but the brushwork does not bespeak the master. For, for instance, on the screen right now is a, a drawing that's part of an album of 98 preparatory uh, drawings. It's um, a group portrait of Suikoden heroes, the Suikoden, the, the great Chinese martial epic, and the Suikoden imagery was so central to this China boom that Tim and Asano-san uh, talked about that persisted through the 19th century. And the Suikoden 
the translations into Japanese, and the illustration, the illustrations created by Hokusai and his contemporaries were central to this phenomenon of a boom in interest in China. This album of uh, 98 drawings was um, studied by uh, Harold P. Stern of the Free Ga Freer Gallery. Uh, this is uh, Frank Felton's uh, um, predecessor of a few generations ago. In 1965, he left comments in the notebook at the Met stating that this album was a composite of fine and wrong things. But the majority are by the hand of Hokusai, he said. Then he continued, it would be interesting to break this down by different hands. A real charmer of an album. And then he continued, he says, probably some of his daughter's things are here. She was very, very capable. So here we have Phil Stern, Harold P. Stern, already in the 1960s, raising the issues that still concern specialists and still concern us here. In uh, 1994, Nagata Seiji went through the same set of albums and uh, my former colleague Masako Watanabe uh, translated and recorded his comments on the various drawings. And he had marked about 15 out of 98 as from the master's hands. My own list varies a bit, but about the same number. He um, observed, for instance, um, this work on the right is from the Metz album, on the left from the Rijksmuseum. The, the work is signed Saki no Hokusai Taitoshitsu. But when we compare them, we can see that the Metz illustration, the drawing, was probably a preparatory drawing for this, but was it done by Hokusai or by Taito II? Who seems to be connected to so many of the works in this album. So this album probably came from Taito II's studio, was acquired by Captain Frank Brinkley. And then in 1892, Charles Stuart Smith went on his honeymoon, acquired over a thousand prints and paintings and uh, books and drawings from Brinkley. And then it entered the Metz collection in 1914. I just briefly want to mention this wonderful compendium of drawings that shows miniature drawings. They're just about the same size as the illustrations from the, the great picture book of everything, just small works. And you can see hoax size, brilliant, creative, sense here of trying to work out an idea for the 12 animals of the zodiac and we don't know exactly how these were used and there are 548 of these illustrations in two albums but we think they were used uh, for based on netsuke designs sword furniture it's interesting that these illustrations were collected by edgar a Walter, a sculptor from San Francisco who died in 1938 and it was passed on to his wife and we were uh, able to acquire from her. But the interesting thing is when I look at some of uh, uh, Edgar Walter's works, he does also do monumental stone friezes and sometimes he has animals surrounded by a cornucopia of uh, plants and flowers and vegetables. And I wonder if that he might have derived some inspiration from this work. I just want to conclude my comments with a mention of this album of 25 leaves that have 28 different drawings. And these are comparable to the British Museum's and uh, Boston's work. This is the picture book of Japanese and Chinese warriors in the Katsushka style. It must date to around 1836 or so when other works were being uh, compiled. And this is similar in that it 
very meticulous block ready uh, drawings and it raises the same sort of questions of why so much time and energy was invested did they not get uh, published and so we imagine that maybe because of the tempo a uh, famine that this set of drawings wasn't translated into a printed book it's possible that Hoksai was waiting for to get the right carver keeping in mind that two of the books of military themes were published in 1836 with the uh, carver egawa uh, Tome, tomokichi but then the third volume in the set wasn't published until 1850 and so and it was published by uh, to, uh, tomokichi's son egawa sentaro so Hokusai was often holding out until he could get the right carver uh, to work on the, the compositions. And then another factor when looking at these is to keep in mind the characteristics of the brushwork that we've been talking about. Uh, Matty Fore in his work on Hoxai's drawing talked about the characteristics and the distinguishing and common features in Hoxai's drawing. And he pointed out these, and these have come up in our conversations the rather short brush strokes, the very careful delineated curves, the strong alteration, alternation of wet and dry brush, a carefully considered composition and a difference in treatment of scenery and figures and that's especially for the prints that have a landscape involved so as we look at these examples from boston from the british museum from the met i think that this exercise of looking at a lot of images enables the eye to detect a hierarchy of quality and individual characteristics when the line work of a drawing sings or even if it just purrs with just the right tone we may judge these to be genuine but as i mentioned at the outset this is a very subjective enterprise and it's possible that we've been giving the benefit of the doubt to works that are by talented pupils, whether Taito II, Isai, or most importantly, his daughter, Aoi. Uh, to conclude, I just want to say that uh, museums like the British Museum, the MFA, Freer Sackler, the Met, and others that make high resolution images uh, readily available online, it not only is a delightful way to engage with a cornucopia of enjoyable images by Hoxai and his contemporaries, but it also allows all of us to engage in the practice of looking closely and sensitizing our eyes and minds, not only to the drawings themselves, but also to the paintings, prints, and illustrated books with which they are so closely associated. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that very stimulating presentation. Um, you are somebody who has been really a very central figure in Hoxai studies internationally. Uh, you edited two major collected volumes uh, of scholarly essays about Hoxai in addition to your own uh, individual research. I just wanted to ask you from your perspective whether you think we are making progress. I uh, have... Uh been reflecting on the past 30 years of research, collaborative research, uh, beginning with, um, for me, with uh, John Carlo Calza's uh, Venice conferences, and a lot of very solid foundational work was done for those conferences. And I think that we're ready to go to a next stage of collaborative research, but I do really think that it's crucial for scholars in Japan and Europe and the Americas 
to be talking with each other and sharing information. And I think we are making progress uh, because we're, we're talking to each other and we're sharing information and that's what's so important. I agree. And I think the way I've put it sometimes in the past is that Hokusai as an artist, as a phenomenon, is far bigger than any one scholar can really grasp. He's so long lived, he's so prolific, uh, he's so influential and his output, you know, is scattered all around the world. So in addition to our individual um, thoughts and uh, perspectives on the artists, which are very valuable, uh, if we can also continue to collaborate, uh, share collections and share new discoveries, uh, I think that will um, make the whole, the whole, it makes the whole process actually much more enjoyable, personally for me. Um, but I think we'll achieve uh, some amazing results. So that's great. Thanks very much, John. And our final speaker uh, today is Frank Feltons in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Smithsonian. Uh, Frank, too, has uh, curated a very successful exhibition on Hokusai uh, and authored a book on his paintings. Uh, very pleased to have him with us this evening. And he's focusing on what for me is the Ninth Symphony of uh, Hokusai Block Ready Drawings, which he's going to introduce to us now. Frank. Thank you, Tim. And I also want to thank my, my uh, fellow panelists today uh, for their enlightening talks. And I have to say, um, I have to be perfectly honest at the outset by saying that I came to the study of Hokusai uh, much later than uh, many uh, than our fellow panelists today, and I know much less about it. <laughs> I only started thinking about Hoxai when I got hired at the Freer and Sackler five years ago. But because Hoxai is such an important part of our collection and our institutional identity, I feel very strongly about uh, um, studying Hoxai, wanting to delve into his mastery, and really while doing that from virtually the first day that I arrived at the Freer and Sackler, I discovered so many uh, fascinating aspects about him by talking to uh, people like Tim, John, Sarah, various other scholars also in Japan. And I really discovered him to be the, uh, the um, groundbreaking and extraordinary artist that he is known as. And um, so for today's talk, I, I picked three works from our current exhibition, Hoxai Mad About Painting, which are also really dear to me personally, as I was discovering Hoxai and thinking about him, uh, not through the lens so much of connoisseurship or uh, questions of authenticity, but more about Hoxai's creative process and what he, uh, what went into uh, his creating this extraordinary uh, final series of prints, 100 poets, one poem each explained by the wet nurse. And um, so today I want to take a closer look at these works, thinking about their relationship between uh, text and image and how Hoxai translated these classical poems from a 13th century anthology into uh, pictures that were very much contemporary to his own time and really um, to me convey his artistic sensibilities, but also his analytical skill as a painter. Uh, one of the essences I personally find uh, to be uh, at the core of Hoxai's artistry is his almost uh, psychoanalytical approach to painting, where he's trying to tease out the very essence, the personality, if you will, of everything he's painting, be it um, a person, be it a deity, uh, the sea, down to fish and crabs, I, <laughs> there is, uh, the sky is the limit, but Hoxay always wanted to get, I feel, at the essence of things. So these drawings are very interesting, um, uh, uh, very interesting pieces of evidence of this and show different layers of Hoxay's engagement with his subject matter. So if you take this, uh, this first drawing here from the series uh, uh, and look at the translation on the, uh, on the right, the waterfall dried up in the distant past and makes not a sound, but its fame flows on and on and echoes still today. So this is, this is a poem that we don't want to go too deep into the poetic uh, uh, illusions that go into play here, but 
uh, it, it is um, it, Hokusai took this uh, this um, this disappearing waterfall in the mind of the poem poet and translated it into the quite into the complete opposite into a visualization of an actual waterfall thundering down and um, giving an ambient sound to the party of uh, uh, that is that is picnicking at its at its foot and you can almost uh, you can see the clouds of the gushing water forming in the in the red pigment that's what I added there but uh, aside from that if you if you look closer at the part at the people picnicking you can see these various uh, expressions these very of the various uh, ways in which these uh, people interact with each other and um, some of these figures can be found elsewhere. They are part of Foxy's artistic practice and are tropes in his work, as it were. But they are, they are all used in this in this organic manner in a way that they create this larger whole that then um, uh, reflects uh, the uh, the poem um, almost uh, almost verbatim. But and, but I do want to emphasize that these classical poems were really translated into a contemporary. Uh, a world of Hokusai's own time. So this, uh, and emphatically focusing not on the upper classes of the uh, of the kind that these poets came from, but on uh, um, um, commoners, uh, as it were, of Hokusai's own uh, class, but also many of his clients. And then to add another layer to Hokusai's uh, um, interaction between uh, uh, text and image, this is actually uh, one of my favorites in our exhibition, also in our collection, because it so very subtly but meaningfully connects the poem with the picture. Um, and I do want to start with the text first, although the cartouches are, uh, are much smaller than the picture itself, but I feel so sorry for you. No one comes to mind who would say that to me, so I will surely die alone of a broken heart. So this is clearly a love poem that uh, um, of uh, of a person uh, of of the of of a person um, whose love is not being reciprocated. Very a very heartwarming and sad uh, timbre uh, pervades this poem. So if you look at the painting itself, there is no, there are no lovers. There is no direct connection, overtly co a direct connection between the poem itself and the image. But if you look very closely to the spindle, uh, um, to, um, to the spindle, to the upper part of the spindle, just to the right of the, uh, of, of the window in the house, you see an inscription there. And, um, when I spotted this inscription, I started looking it up in various uh, sources, and I found that it's a, a small section of the Avatamsaka Sutra, um, uh, the Flower Garland Sutra, that talks about how the essence of Buddhist practice and the essence of um, of, of, um, of being is lies within the heart. And I find that to be almost a message of all you need is love, in a sense that uh, um, the uh, that the poem basically Hoxai puts a positive uh, um, a spin on a, on, a, on, an, on an emphatically melancholy poem. I'm saying this about every one of these drawings, but this is truly my favorite in our collection because it has so many layers uh, of meaning. If we had never met, I would not so much resent your being cold to me or how I've come to hate myself because I love you so. Um, again, uh, um, a poem about, about the feeling of abandonment or the feeling of unreciprocated love. But the, but the drawing in and of itself uh, embodies so many different layers of meaning that both apply to this very poem, but go be far beyond it. So if you would just look for a moment at the small boy in the lower, uh, in the left center of the, um, of this nighttime scenery at a temp, at a, um, at a shrine. Uh, he is the, the Japanese a version of, the, of Merlin the magician, if, as it were, Abe no Seime, as a child. And this, um, uh, this drawing really um, encapsulates his origin story and condenses it into one scene. He is, he's sitting there at this nighttime shrine with his father, and they are gazing out into the distance, seeing these uh, ethereal fox fires in the distance. 
you know, um, beckoning, telling them that there is something supernatural approaching them in, in the middle of the night. And the background of this story is such that Abin Oseime's mother had disappeared at a certain point. And here she is at the very center of the image, returning to them and revealing herself to be not a human being, but a fox. So the very essence of Abin Oseime's powers, because he's not just a human being, a mere mortal, but he is also partly a fox. So, um, so this, uh, this beautiful story is, is, is condensed here by Hoxha into, into really a very compelling work of art that even though the night is not rendered as such, you can, you can still feel the, almost a, the, the teeny tiny sound of, of, the, of the water flowing down the tree right there. Or, or rustling of her robes as she is approaching from the darkness. I find this to be very atmospheric and really, truly uh, a, a reflection of what Hoxai's uh, artistry is all about. And I do want to add uh, a note about uh, this, um, the uh, Hoxai's artistic practice as well. So if you look at the uh, at Abin Oseime's mother uh, approaching there, you notice that this section was previously cut out of the original drawing, and then a, another sheet was pasted on and the figure was redrawn. This is Hoxai, this is part of Hoxai's creative process. If he wasn't uh, satisfied with a specific part of his drawing, that part would be cut out, another piece of paper pasted on, and Hoxai would redraw that section. Um, um, so this is um, 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 uh, an aspect that you find all throughout his, his, his drawings and really shows you the, um, his minute attention to details because it's oftentimes not just a single figure like this, but down to a hand, down to a face, teeny tiny details that he considered to be ina inadequate for the final publication of the print. Thank you so much, Frank, um, for that very sensitive, may I even say poetic, uh, reading of those three beautiful uh, poet drawings, reminding us there's more to the study of Hoxai than uh, connoisseurship and technique, uh, important though they may be. In, in our conversation with uh, Dr. Asano earlier, he began to make some um, very uh, interesting proposals about the 100 Poets series in particular, uh, the idea that Hoxai and his daughter Oi may have both been involved in this series, uh, contrasting a particular kind of uh, busy, complex uh, line that Hoxai was doing as an old man with the ability of Oi, Asana san thinks, to draw long extended uh, tapering lines but the even more radical suggestion that maybe the two, because they're living together, uh, father and daughter are collaborating, collaborating within the same drawing. Uh, the examples he gave, that was quite clear. I've gone to more examples from the Hunter Poets series uh, and quickly got lost, but I think it's a really, really interesting suggestion. I wonder, Frank, do you have any thoughts on uh, how or if or in what way uh, Oi and Hoxai might have collaborated on these drawings. I do find the proposal of uh, thinking about uh, Oi sort of working in these sweeping lines very interesting because I do um, because I mean just lo by looking at some parts of our collection, there is really this emphasis on 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 really uh, on, on sweeping lines in a uh, in a way that it, it seems uh, almost as if this is uh, this is a connecting. Uh, aspect of the style of these uh, drawings in so many ways. So that's very fascinating. And personally speaking, as a curator at the Freer and Sackler, I would love uh, for some of these works to have definitive uh, involvement by Oi. I think <laughs> uh, we get this question a lot from our visitors, you know, where is Oi in this, uh, um, in this artistic practice? And they would love to be able to say uh, definitively, oh yeah, here she is. Mm -hmm. um, and beyond that, uh, I could very well imagine uh, that, uh, you know, some of the corrections could also have been performed uh, um, sort of in, in consultation between the two or, or perhaps even by Oi herself. And also thinking about that Hoxai himself took over a Hyakunin Ishiju commission from Oi uh, just around the time when these drawings were made. I think the, there is um, 
definitely is a possibility of a correlation there. Thank you, Frank. Well, I hope that uh, our viewers will have realized that there is a huge amount of Hokusai and Hokusai school material out there, thousands and thousands of works. Uh, and not only a large quantity of works, but a huge enthusiasm, I think, around the world for Hokusai uh, and his art. As curators, we see this every time that a major Hokusai exhibition is staged, people flood uh, in their thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, to engage with Hokusai's works. There seems to be something that people really, really enjoy, uh, a kind of common humanity, I suspect, uh, that everybody can discover uh, in his works. So the work, the work of connoisseurship of, of distinguishing the hand of the master from the hand of the daughter and then the hand of the pupil um, may seem a little bit ungenerous uh, when people can so easily enjoy all of, the, all of the stages of drawing, all of the kinds of drawing uh, that we have in our collections. But I do think it's an important thing that we need to keep doing. Uh, and I do hope we're making progress. Um, I like very much Sarah's suggestion of tackling the problem from the other end. That is, starting with the works of the pupils, works that are demonstrably by the pupils, uh, and confirming what we can find out about those, and then heading back towards Hokusai. Uh, I sense that uh, there is a real potential there uh, for uh, steadily uh, sorting out this mass of thousands and thousands of drawings. John used the word colloquium, which uh, I love because it's people chatting together. Uh, the event today has to be a virtual colloquium uh, for obvious reasons, the pandemic. Also, we need to think about our carbon footprints uh, traveling around the world on jets to uh, examine drawings. However, I'm now going to contradict myself and say that one of the greatest loves, uh, uh, one of the greatest experiences as a curator is to engage with the actual drawing right in front of you. Uh, and to uh, relive the energy of the intelligence of Hoxai's uh, great brain going through his arm, through his brush and onto the paper, uh, and the buzz and the incredible energy that uh, personally I always uh, get from his, his best drawings. So I think I'm saying I'm looking forward to an opportunity in the future uh, when maybe we can all be in the same room again for a, a live workshop with some uh, great works of Hoxai. But I think it's also very good uh, that we share uh, the discussions that we engage with, with with a wider public. It's not just the collections are absolutely not just there for us, they're for the whole world. Would anybody else like to add a comment? Can I maybe call on Sarah since she was the first speaker? Um. Well, the main thing I can think of is to uh, to thank you and all the people involved in the ongoing research project at the British Museum, because that has shed so much light on what the rest of us have. Um, and uh, there, of course, is still more to come. Um, yet another topic that we, we touched on, um, but that I would definitely like to see further research researched uh, is um, the sources, uh, both visual and uh, literary. Uh, that Hokusai was drawing on. I, I think there's far more that we can learn about that. So that's another interesting angle of approach in the future. Could I just jump in there and give a uh, particular thanks to one of my uh, lockdown collaborators, Yasuhara Akio, uh, yes. who helped me massively in uh, investigating the, particularly the India and China drawings in the set of 103 and going into many um, Chinese printed sources or other versions of the same subject. Um, this really was a, a collaborative effort. So thank you, Akio. John, if you have any final thoughts. Well, I would just like to echo what uh, Sarah just said about how the British Museum's Hokusai Research Project has uh, stimulated all of us to think about how works in our collection that are understudied could uh, become more accessible and we can um, have more to share about them in the future. I think that's a very exciting and 
thank you very much for making that possible. Last but not least, Frank. Yes, I also want to echo John and Sarah's remarks about the research project, uh, research space, which really almost digitally visualizes the thinking processes that go uh, on in uh, the head of, of any art historian, uh, but goes beyond this because I certainly cannot keep all that information in my <laughs> little brain, but still. Um, and I also want to congratulate him and the entire team at the British Museum on this incredible discovery and acquisition of the great picture book of everything, which really um, adds such an important and um, mesmerizing layer onto the study of Hoxai as an artist. Thank you. Thank you very much, panel. Um, and if any of you or indeed any of our listeners find themselves in London before the 30th of January at the beginning of next year, uh, you'll find the Great Picture Book of Everything on display uh, at the British Museum. I've also been asked to mention uh, another event in this series relating to Hokusai. Uh, the title is Edo Period Japan and its Cultural Connections. And that will take place on Thursday, the 18th of November, between 1800 and 1900 hours GMT. Uh, it's available to book via the British Museum's website and will be streamed on Zoom and YouTube. So do uh, join that event as well if you can. So thank you very much to my panel once more and farewell to you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.